Good evening, everyone. I'm John Clarkson, president of the Pine Hills Neighborhood uh, Association. Welcome to our meeting tonight. Our guest speaker tonight is Brent Irving. He is a senior planner with CDTA who will provide an update on the Washington Western BRT plan. That's bus rapid transit, if you're not in the know. And here's a look at our whole agenda. I just spoke about Brent. We will also have our usual committee and officer reports. They are listed there. And uh, from that, you'll get a good view of what's going on in the neighborhood, the neighborhood association, what we're doing. Also, we are often joined by local elected officials or uh, even uh, representatives of uh, statewide elected officials or rather state representatives. And so we give them some time to talk at the end too. So that's our program. Uh, we can dispense with the agenda now. Well, if, if you can unshare. Uh, great, so can everyone hear me? Yes? All right, so I wanna mention a couple things. First of all, we're obviously on Zoom tonight. We had hoped to be in person this fall uh, with our meetings, but with the uh, Delta variant and the reemergence of uh, COVID transmission at unacceptable levels for public meetings, we're meeting only on in Zoom. Uh, the best guess at this point is that we'll continue through our fall meetings, which are in September, October, November on the third Thursday night. So our next meeting will be October 21st. We'll have another one November 18th. We presume that will be by Zoom. When our meetings uh, resume in person, we hope and expect it will be at the Pine Hills Public Library branch. That's a great place to meet and they have good space. The other advantage for us as a small neighborhood association is they are used to and qualified to make judgments about when it's safe to have uh, public meetings in their meeting rooms. So that way they get to make the judgment as they're making it for many other activities, public activities in the city of Albany. And uh, so we're glad of that. We hope it comes back soon, but uh, the pub open meetings, the public meetings that is, but we can't say when it will be. So that's the first uh, thing I wanted to leave with. The second is this, and uh, we sent out a blast email to all our membership today on it. Uh, the Neighborhood Association is looking for board members. Uh, we are looking for people to provide uh, some level of contribution and work. We're not talking about finances here. And to make the association really work, it needs people. A lot of the, all the people on the board do a lot of work, but we are looking for more. And you don't necessarily have to be a board member. There are lots of ways you can help out on a committee or doing specific jobs for uh, the association. We'd really like you to consider that. It's a great way to get involved. It's scalable. You don't have to commit your whole life or, or a large or more time than you can commit. So if you're at all interested, I encourage you to reach out to a board member, send us an email if you like, and uh, let's talk. We're looking in particular for uh, people with modern communication skills. You know, it took me at least a couple months to master Zoom and I'm still not sure I've done it. <laughs> I, I work on every email and constant contact. And, you know, we've got a modern website now to update, but we need sort of more hands on deck. And we're looking for someone, which we have advertised in the past, to run a newsletter for us. There are lots of things like that. You could select one job that you'd be good at and help us out that way. So please think about that. If you're watching this or if you know someone who you think might be interested, have them contact us, we'd love to talk about it. Uh, now I would like to spend just a little bit time catching up on issues. We haven't met since June. And of course uh, the committees and the neighborhood association has been busy during that period. So I wanna catch you on up on what's been happening. You may have seen the newspaper articles about large uh, disturbing parties on Hudson Avenue, which is within Midtown Pine Hills long known as the student neighborhood, although in truth it does include more than students. But in any event, we, the Pine Hills Neighborhood Association and our Midtown Pine Hills Committee work on these issues continually, as do uh, the Albany Police Department and our friends in the Neighborhood Engagement Unit, as do the various colleges and universities, and in particular, the State University uh, of Albany. Uh, a lot of things have happened over the years to work on this. And you'll hear more about that later on when our Committee on University and Community Relations, Luke Rumsey, reports out, and when we hear from our Neighborhood Engagement Unit. 
But I did want to say there has been a very strong response by the city following the uh, the initial uh, outbreak of, of loud, disturbing, and dangerous parties this year. And there has been a heavy, heavy police presence in the neighborhood on weekends. There has been intense oversight by the Division of General Services, the mayor, the police chief, our local council and I all did a walk through the neighborhood the very Monday after uh, the troubles emerged. And so there's been a very strong response. Uh, that's not to say that the problem is solved by any means, but we are grateful for the quick and uh, strong response. And what we're looking for, and we'll continue to work with the city, with Albany Police Department, and with the university and with everyone else, uh, are long-term solutions that can keep this from happening. Uh, it is a wonderful neighborhood. It has some special issues related to being primarily student rentals and rentals in, in many blocks, and we are working on all those things. You'll hear more about that later. The other thing is that we, uh, the Pine Hills Neighborhood Association, wrote a letter in support of the preserving the Academy Station post office. Uh, that is the post office that has been on New Scotland Avenue just about forever that it is intended would be replaced. There's a new mixed use development going in on New Scotland, and yet the US Postal Service has not uh, indicated a permanent choice on that yet. So we are concerned about that. You can see the letter uh, if you're on our, our Google group email, and we'll probably put it on our website as well. Another thing that we're working on uh, very much is the Midtown Pine Hills neighborhood it is missing a lot of trees. There are many blocks that have few or none. And we also have something that the city does want to remove over the long term, and that is blacktop in between the sidewalk and the curb. In other words, where you normally see a grassed tree green area in between the sidewalk and the street, there is instead blacktop. And that's not appropriate for a residential neighborhood. It adds to uh, environmental troubles, including uh, stormwater runoff, including the city being a heat island. A, a street without trees and uh, grass is noticeably hotter and more unpleasant than one that has it. So we are going to be working with the city. We have raised the topic with them several times and found a great deal of traction. The mayor has said, yes, it is the policy to remove those blacktop areas. And she will work with us on that. And uh, she also has a new uh, 2025 trees program it is intended to broaden the existing adopt a tree program so that it can work in better on primarily rental blocks, which we have a lot of in Midtown. So that's going to be a big focus. We're already looking at maps and looking at problem blocks, if you will, that need trees and looking where the blacktop needs to come out. Uh, we've applied for a county grant. And there's also perhaps an opportunity for one of the new Love Your Block grants, if you saw the mayor's press release or a news article that touched on that. So there's potentially funding available, but most of all, we are trying to marshal volunteer and other resources to bring attention to this and to help both of these goals move forward. The last thing I want to talk about is the Lights in the Park uh, fundraiser for the Police Athletic League. You have probably seen the newspaper articles that mentioned uh, severe problems there last year, although in truth, there have been problems for many years with traffic congestion and uh, also uh, an impact on the park and other park users. There have been two meetings about this in addition to a number of discussions and press articles and all of those things. Uh, Pine Hills, as the controversy uh, emerged, decided we should look at it. We did adopt a resolution, which is on our, our website if you wanna look at it. It says basically we very much support the Police Athletic League and their mission. Uh, and we know that many people like lights in the park. It is enjoyed by many, and those things are important. But still, the problems must be uh, addressed, the congestion and the impact, which we are not necessarily experts on, but it should be addressed. We also did hear from our members that there were uh, dissatisfaction with pedestrian access to the park during uh, the Lights in the Park Festival. We'd like to see improvements there. So tonight, just before this meeting, I did attend a meeting at the Fort Orange Club that was sponsored by the Police Athletic League and their advisory commission. The mayor was there, police department, traffic engineering, and other people like that, as was the Washington Park Conservancy and I believe four other neighborhood associations. So 
PAL is working on and proposing uh, significant alterations to lights in the park. I can't tell you that any of this is settled. It was in the context of a continuing presentation and outreach to the neighborhood associations. Uh, the mayor has said the city has not decided to approve a permit yet. That review is in process, but uh, PAL did offer and the mayor confirmed that they have mapped out, for example, the electrical grid, it has been certified by electrician as to be meeting standards. And uh, they're also working on plans to cut it back. I'll give you the highlights. I can't say it's a, a done plan or anything like that. And I don't know, as I don't think anyone in the room, what's going to happen. But the plan is that uh, the number of cars would be reduced to a maximum of 900 cars per night. All entry would be through advanced ticketing. So cars wouldn't be driving up just to try to get in. And uh, Apparently, the uh, reduced numbers would be within a traffic engineering study that was done by MGA Engineering and uh, could be scaled back if that was also found not to be effective. So uh, that part looks good if indeed it is properly calibrated and does work. But again, it's, a, it's not at a done stage, as you would say. There will be no ticket booth. There will be no lights in the playground that there used to be or in the dog park. So the number of lights will be constrained. It will go down to 105 displays from about, I don't know, 135, 140. It wasn't clear quite what the top number had been. Uh, and there will be some other changes, although those weren't committed to 100%, but a shorter duration of the event, particularly during setup and takedown. And uh, the commitment to allow for pedestrian access early in the evening, which often doesn't happen or often doesn't happen for enough time has been made, although it's, it's not clear, it wasn't clear to the folks in the room specifically what that was gonna be. Probably from 5.45 to 6.30, which I don't know, it doesn't seem that much different from last year, uh, they will have it open for pedestrians only, uh, but that is still in the planning. So that's kind of the big picture news from that. We will pass on anything we get from PAL in terms of their descriptions of the plan. And uh, we'll keep you posted, which is not to say we'll be uh, first to know about it. Obviously, it's the, the city's responsibility as the permitting authority. That was all I had. Our, oh, there are a couple of events I want to note. Uh, the Madison Avenue Street Fair, the Upper Madison Street Fair will occur Sunday, September 26, from noon to 5 p.m. with vendors, food, music, and art. It's great to be having that event again this year. It is outdoors, so uh, you know, less of a risk and uh, hopefully a good time. So put that on your calendar. You can find more through our website, uh, which links to the Upper Madison Group's website and the Street Fair, dis Fair description. Also this Saturday, September 18th, from 4 p.m. to 10 p.m., there will be a Middle Madison Block Party uh, that is sponsored by the businesses who occupy the block between uh, Quail and Ontario, uh, Cinco de Mayo, uh, the flower shop, the wine shop, several other restaurants there. I don't have the full list in front of me, but there will be some specials and activities. So if you're able to stop by that, go ahead and that. That's, uh, we did send out an email on this and it's on our Facebook page as well. Those are all my announcements. Are there any others from our board members? Um, I'm just going to jump in quick. Um, sorry to interrupt. Can you please just provide the dates and times for the Upper Madison Street Fair and the Mid um, Madison Block Party? Those two? The Upper Madison Street Fair, Sunday, September 26, noon to 5 p.m., and the Middle Madison Block Party, September 18th, from 4 p.m. to 10 p.m. All right, seeing nothing else from the board, uh, I'd like to proceed. Our guest speaker again is Brent Irving, a senior planner with CDTA, who's gonna provide an update on the Washington Western BRT plan. Brent? Thank you, John. Uh, and also good to see you too, Will. Hello.
Okay, let me just go into presentation mode here. So yes, thank you, John, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Um, and thank you for letting CDTA present on the future of Washington Western BRT Bus Plus Purple Line and some of the infrastructure that you will be seeing constructed next year, specifically at locations that are within or very close to uh, the Pine Hills neighborhood. My name is Brent Irving. I'm a senior planner at CDTA. I work primarily on station design and corridor planning for our BRT routes and local bus service. Uh, the way the presentation is set up is that I will go through a little bit of the background on CDTA's bus plus service, not only in Albany, but across the capital region. We will discuss the types of BRT infrastructure which currently exist on our BRT routes and how that infrastructure directly translates into enhanced service. And we will discuss specifically what stations on the purple line will be impacted by construction next year. I'll then walk us through each station and the plans for our future BRT improvements. Um, there will be plenty, of, I think there will be plenty of time um, for questions, but I'd prefer to, to answer questions at the end. And we can certainly toggle back through the PowerPoint if you need me to bring up one of the site plans for, for reference. The next few slides will be a refresher on CDTA Bus Plus service. Bus Plus is CDTA's premier bus rapid transit service, which I'll refer to throughout the presentation as BRT. Uh, and it really stands above our normal neighborhood service in terms of onboard bus amenities, infrastructure, reliability, and frequency of service. If you've ever seen any of the silver and red 905 buses on Central or our silver and blue bus 922 and 923 buses on Pearl Street and Broadway traveling through Albany, uh, you're familiar with where our BRT services currently exist and the service it provides. Um, BRC, BRT service is a limited stop service, but serves more strategically spaced out enhanced stations with more frequent service. Uh, in some cases, a bus arriving every seven or eight minutes during peak AM and PM hours, as well as covering more hours in the day, particularly in the morning and PM commuter hours. Uh, this is all uh, really an effort to deliver a bus service that is highly predictable and on time and connects residential areas with regional employers and downtown areas. So in short, our Bus Plus efforts are about making transit a high quality and easily accessible product for capital region residents. This map may look familiar if you've attended a CDTA BRT presentation in the past. We always like to refresh people's understanding of the regional connectivity which BRT service provides with over 40 miles of existing or planned BRT corridors. As you know, our BRT service began in 2011 with the commission of the red line, which runs between downtown Albany and downtown Schenectady via central and state streets. Since its launch, the red line has, been, has seen ridership upwards of 1.8 million rides annually and really established the backbone for BRT in the region. Blue Line was launched in October of 2020, connecting Waterford, Cohoes, Troy, and Albany. Uh, and the Purple Line, which will connect downtown Albany to Crossgates Mall via Western and Washington Avenues to major employment and education institutions along those corridors, includes connecting with you Albany through a dedicated busway, which is planned to be completed in conjunction uh, with our construction package for uh, spring and summer of 2022. Zooming in a little bit more on the purple line, which follows corridors that are served through a combination of routes 10, 11, uh, 12, and 114, is planned to terminate at Crossgates Mall and downtown Albany bus station. Uh, as mentioned before, frequency on the purple line will be between uh, every seven to eight minutes during peak AM and PM peak travel times. Specifically for the sake of this conversation, we'll be focusing more on the stations that are circled, uh, which are Allen Street and Madison Avenue station at the intersection of Madison and Allen and Western, Partridge Street and our St. Rose station at the intersection of Partridge and Western and our Quail Street station at the intersection of Western and Quail. Uh, the improvements that will occur at these 
three stations will be similar to the improvements that were made along the blue line this past year. Uh, we will be replacing the existing green shelters with modern BRT branded purple and silver shelters. The shelters in the station areas are larger in addition to being able to be equipped with overhead heating elements. One big improvement at the stations and within the horizontal work is that we are installing heated sidewalks at our BRT station beneath the primary boarding and alighting areas, which really help with snow melt and safety and keeping walkways and paths at stations clear from ice and snow. We will also be adding queue jumpers, uh, which I'll refer to as partly in this presentation as mini bus lanes um, and new transit priority signals at the intersections of Partridge and Quail. Queue jumpers and tra transit signal priority allow the bus to pull out of general traffic on the approach and exit from a station free of competition with general traffic or parked cars. This is a huge safety improvement from the operations perspective uh, and removes the burden on the bus operator to merge back into general traffic. Uh, and just for reference, uh, in the lower right corner, we recently constructed a queue jumper and transit signal um, in Albany at Lark Library Station on Washington Avenue. And these two queue jumpers that will be installed at Quail and Partridge uh, will operate almost identically to that signal if you're familiar with that area. And of course, you also see new purple and silver BRT branded buses running and serving the corridor as opposed to the normal CDTA blue buses. Uh, but BRT buses also have free Wi-Fi for any passengers that are aboard and are just generally a more, have a more comfortable feel. The interior seats are a little bit nicer and they have a little bit better finish than our normal blue buses. And there really is a direct connection between infrastructure and the level of service that can be provided to our transit riders. Each of these infrastructure improvements has a benefit uh, to the service, which is delivered and compounded to produce a more reliable, frequent, and high quality service. The expanded shelters allow for more area for passengers to get out of inclement weather. Heated sidewalks aid with snow melt and safety and help with our maintenance response times during heavier winter storms. Expanding the boarding and alighting areas allows us to provide more service on the line, uh, specifically with having articulated buses on the corridor, not the normal 40 footers, but the, the ones with the bend in the middle. That's a 60 footer bus that's called an articulated bus. That allows the vehicle to get directly to the curb and have all doors on the curb. So people can exit and enter um, the bus at the same time, rather than having all boardings and alightings go through the front door. And this has a direct impact on speeding up the boarding and alighting process and improves the on-time performance of the system. Bus-only lanes and queue jumpers uh, remove the bus from general traffic, as mentioned before, and allow a dedicated right-of-way for the bus to perform boarding and alighting, free from conflict with general traffic, and reduces congestion. All these pieces, or uh, essentially basically a kit of BRT parts uh, add up to a rapid, more dependable service that we are happy to provide capital region residents. So we'll, we'll shift gears a little bit. Um, that covers the background of BRT. Um, and we, I, I wanted to make sure we could review the stations as well. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the existing conditions at each site. Um, and then go through some of the infrastructure improvements that will occur at each site as part of the Purple Line improvements. The next sl several slides will follow um, an order that establishes existing conditions at the intersections. I'll call attention to where the bus stops currently are in the aerial, show the limits of the proposed work as part of the Purple Line, and then I'll show the improvements that will take place. So it'll be a series of three slides for each site. Um, and just so everyone can orient themselves correctly with the aerial that they're seeing, uh, this is the intersection of Allen Street and Western Ave, commonly known as the point. I think everyone's familiar with that. A couple of landmarks in there as well, including the public library uh, and police station. Um, throughout each site plan and existing conditions is uh, north is up, south is down, and east-west follow accordingly. Um, I'll also be referring to at some point eastbound and westbound services that corresponds to the direction of travel of the bus. 
Uh, so towards downtown Albany would be eastbound service, and that will be the sites on the bottom of Western Air, uh, Western Ave. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but it'll always be the, the station that is on the bottom side of Western, and westbound service will always be the station that is on the top side of Western Ave. So I stated, stated before the intersection is Allen and Madison with additional landmarks. Whoops, sorry about that. Let me just get back to this. Um, and the areas that are highlighted in blue and the hatched area are our existing bus shelters. Uh, the area enclosed within the dash border are the limits of the work areas for each station. Uh, for this site, the work areas are largely within the footprint of the existing shelters and bus stops. Uh, the improvements that you are seeing are color coded so you can easily recognize the infrastructure in the slide and then the following slides as well. The light gray portions are new sidewalk improvements and ADA compliant curbs. Uh, dark gray is new concrete bus pads installed in the street where the bus would normally stop and pick up passengers. So this gray area is actually that's uh, where the bus would be stopping. We perform this treatment at uh, high volume bus stops and BRT stations because it helps preserve the integrity of the roadway a bit better and extends the life of the pavement due to the weight of the bus and the repeated load on the roadway. Oops, sorry, I keep on going past. The purple areas are where the new BRT shelters and pylons will be located. Uh, the eastbound station will have a larger expanded shelter. Uh, with more available seating. And the red portions are where we'll be installing the heated sidewalks. And those are uh, primarily where people would be expected to board the bus or get off the bus. Um, and the heated sidewalks are basically installed within the concrete. There's a heating element uh, that's installed during the pour, the pour of the concrete, similar to you know, radiant heating in your house or, or, or a heated floor and maybe like a bathroom or something. Uh, the red portions will not be red sidewalks. They will be the normal uh, gray color. Um, largely, the station footprint does not change at this location, but what will be very noticeable when construction takes place and when the station is finished is the new larger BRT style shelters. And we will also be restriping the new, uh, with new crosswalks at the intersection as well. Moving on to our Partridge St. Rose station. Uh, these are the existing conditions at the intersection of Partridge and Western Ave. We currently have two bus shelters in the westbound direction adjacent to Alumni Quad at U Albany. The eastbound stop is located at, um, at the corner at 178 Partridge uh, and does not currently have a bus shelter. A few other landmarks to, to orient yourself with. Um, the LaSalle School is to the Northwest and the College of St. Rome Campus Security Office is here as well. Again, the areas enclosed within the dashed border are the limits of the work areas for each station. For this site, we are moving the location of the existing eastbound bus shelter uh, to the far side of Partridge, meaning it currently is on the near side of the intersection as the bus is traveling in the eastbound direction and will be on the far side of the intersection when construction is complete. The location of the westbound uh, bus station remains on the same footprint. Again, the color coding system remains the same here. Light gray portions are new sidewalks and ADA improvements. We are installing new curb ramps at all four corners of the intersection. The eastbound station will have an expanded boarding and a lighting area, as well as a curb extension uh, being moved far side. Dark gray portions are new concrete bus pads where the bus will be normally stopped, be dropping off and picking up passengers. Uh, this intersection is the location of one of the Q jumper and TSP signals planned on the corridor. The area of the bus pad in the westbound direction uh, where it says bus only is exclusive to bus use. 
This roadway is wide enough here to maintain a lane of through traffic and provide dedicated right of way to allow for bus operations to occur unobstructed by general traffic. The signal will provide priority to departing buses with a dedicated bus signal, allowing buses to travel through the intersection to merge back into the travel lane ahead of the traffic in the same direction that is waiting for, for their green light. The, again, the purple areas are new BRT shelters and pylons. The westbound station will have a larger, uh, much larger expanded shelter with more available seating for students. Uh, again, since the eastbound direction is moved far side, we are able to provide a shelter here as well. And also the same treatment for heated sidewalks in the primary boarding and alighting areas along the curb in front of the shelter. Uh, in the primary areas where we know people are going to be getting on and off the bus. These are the existing conditions at uh, Quail Street at the intersection of Quail and Western, uh, the future location of our Quail Street station. We currently have bus stops in both the east and westbound direction on the near side location of the intersection, highlighted in blue. Uh, we currently do not have bus shelters uh, at this intersection. Um, a couple of other identifiers here. You have De Carlitos Pizza on the northeast corner of the page, Crave in the northwest, uh, and Metro Pizza on the southeast corner. Areas enclosed within the dash border are the limits of the work areas for each station. For this site, the work areas are, again, largely staying within the footprint of the existing site of the current bus stops. And lastly, going through the color coding system again, light gray portions are new sidewalks and ADA improvements around the shelter. The eastbound station will have an expanded boarding area and curb extension, in addition to having a new shelter installed. Uh, the dark gray portions, again, are new concrete bus pads where the bus would normally be stopped. This intersection is the location of the second Q jumper and TSP signal planned on the corridor. Uh, the area in the westbound direction that says bus only, again, is exclusive to bus use. And the roadway here is wide enough to allow the same operations for a bus only and Q jump lane and allow normal traffic in the westbound direction to proceed without any conflicts. Just to round out the presentation, we can offer a bit of timeline and the next steps on the project. We are currently finalizing our design, which will be submitted to the FTA for a final approval and funding. Whoops. Construction is tentatively scheduled to begin in the spring of 2022, uh, with most of the work to take place during the 2022 construction season. And any remaining portions of work that are not completed next year will be carried over into the construction season for 2023. The target launch date for the Purple Line is to have purple and silver buses serving the corridor in the fall of 2022, uh, likely with a full rollout in the summer of 2023. Um, and that concludes um, my presentation for the evening. And I'd be happy to toggle back through any slides. I know I kind of went through the site plans a little fast. And if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them for you. And John, I'll remain in, in presentation mode so I can toggle back to the PowerPoint. Great. Thanks, Brent. Uh, questions? Remember to unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. Do I have to? I'll just call on people when I see the hand raised. You raise. can see them. Yeah, I can see them. So, yeah. Carolyn, sure. Yeah, my actually my only question at this point is what is a pylon? Is that the sign thing? Uh, yes. So if you've ever been out on the 905 uh, on Central and you've seen next to the station, there's a large, you know, color coded silver and red sign. That's the pylon. Uh, Perry. Perry. Hi, Brent. Thanks so much for this uh, presentation today. Um, I, mean, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm fascinated by the heated sidewalks part. So I just was wondering, uh, do you know how they're powered? 
Um, is it electric? Is it some sort of thermal? I feel like we're in the Jetsons age here. This is so <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's electric power. Okay. So there's a control, there's a control unit. Um, it's similar in shape, shape and size to a traffic control, traffic signal control cabinet. Um, and basically from the control cabinet, they lay um, conduit in the concrete that is the thermal insulator. So basically it's a copper wire and that copper wire heats up and radiates through the concrete and heats up the sidewalk. And it's not, you know, you can't go out there and fry an egg on the sidewalk. It, <laughs> it, only, it, it only comes on during certain conditions. Um, there has to be, so it has a, it has a, temp, a thermal gauge and it has a uh, moisture gauge. So two conditions have to be met. It has to be below 32 degrees and it has to be, the concrete has to be wet. So those are the only two um, conditions where the heated sidewalks will turn on. It's a fantastic safety feature that you thought of. So thanks for that. Yep. So they're not out there. The blue line ones are not out there running right now, just generating all kinds of heat. <laughs> um, I see Eric has a question. Yep. I was just, um, are they going to have trash cans? Uh, just, you know, in yes, general, we'll, they we'll, have trash cans. Yeah. We'll put, we'll. Yes, they'll have trash cans. Um, they'll have some of the other smaller amenities that normally are featured in, in our BRT stations. The one thing I didn't mention is that um, likely what we'll be doing along this corridor is bringing some of the bike share and scooter share amenities to these sites as well. So that, you know, if someone's taking the purple line, they can get off at their stop, hop on a bicycle and take that directly to their house and kind of complete that first mile, last mile gap that, uh, is a constant challenge with transit. Okay. And the, um, well, you mentioned scooters. I was just interested in, in if, sort of off topic, but the electric buses and how they're doing um, is of interest. And in, yeah, if they're looking at scooters, that's, that would be an interesting. Um, so we're still awesome. piloting the electric bus program. Um, the, the, that program is handled mostly with our operations and maintenance department. But for what I'm told, the, pilot is running very well and we're getting a much better range on the electric buses than we're advertised especially during our winter months um, and the data is showing us that electric buses are very viable uh, especially on corridors where there's more congestion um, and i believe the plan is to continue ordering more electric buses um, with that comes some um, storage and charging challenges, but I, I'm pretty sure with a lot of the grants coming out from the federal government that we'll be able to, state and federal, will be able to overcome those challenges and we'll be getting more electric buses on the road. Um, Marilyn? Uh, yes, what, what exactly is a concrete bus pad? So a concrete bus pad is a reinforced concrete slab that is durable and sturdy enough to make sure that it doesn't buckle under the weight of the bus. So if you go out to, let's say, uh, let's see, can I think of one in North? Can I think of one in Pine Hills? I'm thinking of the one at North Manning and Central. That's a BRT stop. And if you go and look where the curb meets the road, you'll kind of see a wave pattern in the asphalt. And that's due to the repeated, the repeated stopping uh, of the bus and the load and weight of the bus basically making the asphalt buckle. Um, and the concrete pad is intended to prevent that from happening in the roadway. So uh, it's basically, if I could just make it you know, as simple as possible, it's an eight inch pad. It's an eight inch concrete pad that's poured during construction. Um, and it allows for our buses to make those repeated, repeated stops at the station. Okay, thank you. Um, it looks like someone named Owner has a question. I'm not oh, sure. Oh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't, know, I don't know why I'm an owner. I, I'm really not an owner, um, but I have a question. And sure. um, 
or more of a comment actually. Um, some years ago when this was first presented, uh, Ross Farrell, I believe at that point was um, working on this. I don't know if you know him, Brent. But in any case, um, when he first talked about this, we made a comment and this relates specifically to the um, Allen uh, Madison point area that the um, design was so modern that um, in our neighborhood, we like to kind of create a streetscape that is um, more sort of old fashioned. And the current bus shelters are really a lot more um, within the character of our neighborhood. So I guess I realize there's nothing to be done because this is what it is, it is what it is. It's just, in my opinion, um, kind of a shame that it's, um, you know, this kind of fairly intrusive, especially on the eastbound part, um, gigantic, more or less, big blue thing. Um, you know, within an area that is um, really we're trying to make look um, more like the other um, features in that particular area. So that's just my comment. Um, there's nothing to be done, as I said, but I think it's just um, kind of a shame, but that's the way it is. So I guess everyone will have to get used to it, basically. That's it. Sure, Virginia. I yeah, I hear your comment. We get those requests um, often for custom shelters. Um, the problem that we see with custom shelters is uh, they don't have the same kind of uh, maintenance that we do with our normal shelters. And you know, we have custom shelters that are out there that need to be replaced more often than um, kind of a a BRT shelter that can come loaded off of a truck and then be assembled, which is more modular. Um, it's just some, you know, keeping in mind long-term costs and maintenance, that's really kind of why we want to make our BRT shelters, you know, a single brand, a single style of shelter. It also kind of raises the, you know, the, the visibility and brand of, of BRT for CDTA as well. Yeah, I understand. Thanks, Brent. Uh, any other questions? I'm not seeing any. All right. Well, thanks very much. You could, if you could take down the screen sharing. Sure. And uh, we thank you for visiting with us. You, you needn't remain through the whole meeting unless you'd like to. But um, we appreciate I, I your don't, presentation. I don't, live, I don't live too far from Pine Hills neighborhood, but I would be remiss to sever my ties with the New Scotland Neighborhood Association if I stayed on. So I must exit. <laughs> I know you're gonna, I mean, you know, there are other, other commitments in life as well, but thank you for joining us. And thank you for letting me present, um, as, you know, as CDTA continues to do work in the region and affects Pine Hills neighborhood, we'll we'd be happy to come back on and present again. Great. Well, I'm sure we will have you back again. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. So I want to move along with the agenda. However, I was planning to go to Luke Rumsey, who does not appear to be here. So I can't do that, obviously. Uh, if he comes in, we'll hear from him later. Uh, Public safety, the, any new uh, staff? Uh, we have Dan Webster and uh, I'm not sure who else here. Dan, would you like to, uh, we got uh, Joe Aquaviva as well. I don't know who wants to go first. I think we'd be most interested in follow-up description of the activities regarding uh, the Hudson Avenue parties. I think Dan's had a little more hands-on approach than I have, so I was waiting for him. Well, his picture just disappeared, uh, Joe. I don't know if that's any indication. You may be on the, the hot spot tonight. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, I don't know what's going on with the picture. 
technical difficulties. But um, as long as you can hear me. Uh, so, yeah, we've had a very busy month. Mm-hmm. Um, I can speak for Luke as far I, I didn't know he was coming or not, but he's been doing a great job of holding the, the students accountable for uh, whatever their involvement might be in some of these really large parties. So uh, on his end, I, he and I are in contact quite a bit and in passing information on who needs to go and who can stay, right? So uh, Luke is doing a great job. I, I, to be honest, we get more enforcement from, from them than we do probably from the court system. So we, uh, we have given out over 100 uh, general city ordinance tickets over the last three weekends. Um, so there is some, a lot of enforcement going on over these parties. Uh, I don't know if that's going to deter it. It has seemed to have gone down the last three weekends. Every weekend has been a little bit better. So we're hoping this weekend it continues uh, going a little bit smaller because uh, of the uh, kids that have gotten kicked out of school and the enforcement. We have, I, have, I can honestly say in my 17 years, I've never seen us put so much manpower on a problem so quickly. So uh, it's got the department's attention and they've, the command staff has been very committed to getting the resources to, to uh, you know, try to keep these parties down to a little bit of a minimum because uh, they got, it was real bad at first. So we're going to stay on that. Um, and, and again, it's not just college students over there. It's, uh, it's a mixture, as you guys know. And uh, that does create to the problem. But uh, statistically, I would say that I don't have a, the, in front of me, I only have the city stats. Things are pretty much on par from where they were last year at this time. So um, as far as that goes, I don't know. I, there's not much I can add to that. But uh, we're doing our best over there. And. If there's large parties that somebody sees that we might not know about, give us give a call to the, the four three eight four thousand so we can earlier the better too because uh, a lot of times once it gets five six seven eight hundred people there it's harder for us to control so we would like to get them early. Our details start at eight p.m. so it'd be it'd be much better to quiet down a party when it's 40, 50 people than when it's a couple hundred. So if people can keep that in mind, if they see a party brewing, kegs going in the door, even if it's at 12 o'clock in the afternoon, we can always knock on the door and say, hey, listen, we know what you guys are planning to do. This is not going to work out. Any questions? I'm sure many. Carolyn and uh, Danielle or Will Melendez, they're sharing a queue tonight, have questions. Okay. Carolyn, Carolyn go ahead. Um, yeah, so thank you for what you guys are working on. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, in terms of calling in, in addition to whatever else was going on, not this past week, no, this past weekend, there was also, I think, Friday night, a car drive one or up, possibly up to three cars driving through this neighborhood, squealing tires, going round and round the block, sometimes going the wrong way up a block. We couldn't get a sighting on them because it went so fast when it went by. Um, I knew that you guys were in the neighborhood, so I didn't really want, and I knew that you had a lot of staffing on what's going on on Hudson. So I didn't, I didn't feel that comfortable calling because I, I've, a, we couldn't identify the car because by the time we reacted to it going back by again, it was gone. And, um, and I wasn't sure what we were supposed to tell you. And I kept thinking, oh, well, it's done. And then 20 minutes later, we'd hear it again. So I don't know if you guys were aware of that or, um, you know, the best way to handle something like that. Um, in addition, I saw um, three police horses um, with officers on it next to Megan and Keegan funeral home yesterday afternoon. I wasn't really clear on that, what that was. Um, and then I, in addition to that, I was just wondering how your staffing levels are doing, which is a little more complicated question. Okay. Uh, I'll start with the first. So when we're running the Pine Hills detail, those guys are on foot majority. Okay. So, but if there are calls that you would call on a Tuesday, like somebody screeching down the street, you can always call 438-4000 and uh, patrol would respond. 
Okay. Um, the horses, I didn't know. I'm assuming they were there uh, standing off for school dismissal. Oh, okay. Back in action. So I thought were maybe there was a... back just in, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I thought maybe there was they were expecting a funeral to be kind and of it could be that too. out of control. Okay. And it was the uh one of our uh, police officers who was killed in the line of duty, his wife passed away and they were at the funeral. Oh, oh I see. Okay, they were honoring him. Okay. Thank you. And Joe I just acts wanted... like he doesn't know what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted, like, if there was something really intense going on, it would have been good to know that, but um, yeah. good to know. Thank you. And uh, as far as our manpower, uh, I know Joe's up at the academy, so he knows better than me probably, but uh, yeah, we're way down. I, I, we lost six officers just last week, so, mm. and that, that was all to different departments, not even retirement. They just, you know, um, it is what it is. So I don't know what our exact number were down, but it, shrinking fast so we're really doing an aggressive push to try to get as many possible bodies as we can from what i'm told uh, i am a joe and i are pt instructors so we've been doing evaluations and trying to get all, you know people uh ready to get in the academy so uh let's joe know something else that i don't that, that that's where we stand for, at least for a little while the the mayor the mayor has uh has came down to the police and they are trying to hire a hundred bodies in the next 12 months Ooh. to bring us back up to the numbers that we should be at. Now we're not a hundred bodies short, but I think their assumption is that as the year goes on, we'll lose a few people through for retirements and other departments. And so if we keep that number as our site number, um, we're hoping that by, you know, this time next year, our ranks should be pretty full. So um, to follow up on that, you know, 100 bodies sounds um, big and important. Um, do you see that as 100 new new police officers that, you, that are new to the profession or possibly drawing from other jurisdictions? And I know you've been having contracting issues, so hopefully there's something that's coming down the pike that will help stem the, the, the leaving and increase the coming. So. We, so if we do have applications that were given to us from other police agencies, I'm not aware of them. I know that, like I said, the mayor um, gave this number to us of 100. And like I said, I believe that her, you know, she's trying to stay in front of the fact that we're going to have people leaving here. And so that's where that number comes from. The, um, as far as officers from other agencies, if they apply here, um, obviously they'll give their resumes a, a look at. And if there's, if, you know, we can utilize them and hire them and get them on the streets, um, that that is definitely always an option that that they look at um but i would imagine that a big majority of that will be new hires um, that are coming in okay danielle right. will thanks thank you uh, hi so so unfortunately danielle and i had uh just got our bikes stolen this morning um, and then when we got the report, so they cut it from the lock. Um, so it's not like they were just loose, but um, when the police came to take our report, they said there has been an increase in theft um, and stuff like that. So I just wanted to know if that was a trend in the neighborhood so we can be more aware. And, and yeah, petty thefts are always, are always uh, a thing that goes on because they're just hard to, you know, they're hard for us to monitor. We have, you know, we have the, a lot of other things that are going on at the time. Um, and so being that our officers are running around dealing with, you know, the, the, the gun violence and, uh, you know, the, the college students and, and other things that are going on, the things that get overlooked are things like our petty thefts, like bicycles, larcenies from vehicles and stuff like that. Um, as, we, as we get more manpower, um, obviously we hope to utilize that and uh, I can tell you that uh, the department is is always looking for uh, new ways and, and innovative ways to to retain employees here um, so I know that we have a couple of things in the works that we're trying to, to implement so that we can you know 
not just keep training people for other departments, but training them to stay here and do the things that we need them to do here. Yeah, I was just wondering in terms of like data, if there was more thefts and stuff yeah. like that. So, uh, it, it's less about those. Yeah, I don't, I don't have the stats for this month on petty crime. Um, okay. But start it, it looks about on par from what it is every year um, around this time. I, I don't have the exact number in front of me, but I, you know, they, you can always go to nixel.com if you want to see stats. It's N I X E L, and it's an app, and you can get every stat possible. And they'll also send you messages on uh, upcoming things or traffic uh, issues and right to email. So it's a good thing to have. Nixel.com. It is, it's a good, it'll give you everything that's going on in your neighborhood. Yeah, and, and yeah, we understand that there's much, there's bigger issues going on than our bikes, <laughs> but we just, uh, it was just the first time that anything had ever been stolen from us, so that's why it just kind of. Uh, oh, it stinks. It's terrible. Yeah. It's, yeah. Oh, it's horrible. It's horrible. You know, it may seem like a small thing in the grand scheme, but to you, it's not a small thing. So, yeah. Marilyn? Yes, just. Um... We have uh, uh, people across the way that uh, seem to, the people that move in there seem to always have motorcycles. And uh, I, I live on Reichman. And it seems like between 1130 and one in the morning, people kind of congregate in that area, revving up these motorcycles. And I, I just, I'm just telling you if you could maybe send some patrol just by every once in a while because it seems to seems to happen on a regular basis. And if I could could mm -hmm. sort of tie on to that, Marilyn, I've I received uh, an email from a member who's not here tonight who's very concerned about, you know, the troops of a ATVs and also motorcycles that go through obviously violating the law in our streets happens fairly regularly. I know in the past we've heard, and I'm familiar with the stress, starting uh, a vigorous pursuit on city streets is a high risk activity and can indeed enhance the risk to pedestrians even versus the crime that's being committed. But I have sensed over time that there's kind of an evolution in the way uh, the Albany Police Department is dealing with this. Is that something, Dan or, or Joe, you could speak to in a general way? So, so I know uh, I spoke with a detective the other day that was tasked. Can you hear me? Just try, try and be closer to your mic, I think is what's happening. So I actually had a conversation with one of our detectives the other day um, who was tasked with this problem. Um, I can tell you that the biggest issue with it is um, we have to do lots of surveillance, lots of photographing, and then find out uh, who the, the people are. A lot of these ATVs and dirt bikes that are getting are riding around the city are actually being trailered into the city. And so um, it actually takes a lot of manpower and a lot of effort to, to identify them. And in reality, the, the most we usually do is hand out a bunch of traffic summonses um, for that. And um, had we not, you know, if it wasn't for the fact that we've been dealing with, uh, with the gun violence that we have, I think we might have more resources to throw at this problem um, just for right now. It's, it's just, it's a lot of, of work for a very minimal uh, payback on it. And so it's, it's an issue definitely. And, and, you know, this is something we've been hearing about for, for a while, um, you know, and in reality, the, we would love to be able to chase them, but um, the, the truth of the matter is it does, it does create a bigger risk for uh, residents in the city than it does for us to catch them. And so, um, you know, that, that's really not an option. And so we, we try to identify them when we can. We try to make arrests if we can. Uh, but the majority of, of the outcomes is a handful of traffic summonses to the parties that, that are involved. Well, it sounds like uh, the, there are enforcement possibilities through surveillance pictures. I don't know whether drones are involved. I think the chief mentioned that once. But it's uh, I get that you can't start a hot 
pursuit every time you hear one, but it is an issue I'm hearing about, so I just want to pass that along. We hope to have the chief in in uh, maybe October, December as well, so we'll, we'll ask about that again. Thank you. And Perry Junjulis, you had a question? Uh, sure, actually, it's a, a, a statement and, a, and then maybe a request. Um, just, I, I just want to just note how much we really miss the community beat cops, you know, uh, that uh, we got to know so well. And, uh, you know, but, but I think that's the understanding you've got a lot on your plates, you know, with the gun violence and with the other more serious things. But really looking forward to when you're able to staff back up and be able to have the community police, you know, the beat cops out again. I mean, they, in my opinion, I saw it in action, Joe, you know, I, I just, I saw it in action. It, it it works. You know, developing that relationship. You know, and it's just unfortunate that you just you, you can't be everywhere. You can't do everything right now. Um, the other thing is just a recommendation. You know, one of the things that would love to see more capacity or funding for is the mobile crisis unit, which is run out of Albany County um, Department of Mental Health. Um, there are a lot of times that we've experienced, and I know other providers and persons have experienced someone who's having a mental health crisis, we call mobile crisis and they tell us they're busy, they don't have enough staff, call the police. And too many times we, you know, we don't call the police because it's, it's a mental health issue that we've got going on, but we need some assistance because the person is acting violently to the point where there could be a, a need for the police. So, you know, I think we, there's other ways also to get you some more help in some ways. And I know in the news, you know, we talked about the, you know, the need for mental health services, mobile crisis uh, for Albany County. It's a wonderful service when they are able to reach us. <laughs> they're able to deescalate. Oftentimes they're able to identify and take someone to the hospital psych unit if they feel there's a you know, need to do that without the police involvement. So I just wanted to make everyone aware of that service that is, it seems like it is truly underfunded when we're calling. And I mean, I want to say a good 75% of the time they're saying, call the police. They, they are like us in the fact that they get so many calls for service, they run out of people to actually send out. And yeah. so there becomes like a waiting list. And that's why a lot, yeah, and that's why a lot of times they'll say, call us. Because we can 941 someone and send them to the hospital, uh, and so we and we have that option. And so don't don't think. I mean, if you feel that someone has the potential to to escalate into something that more than just you know I need some help, um, feel free to contact us. Even if we stand by, that you know you or your staff um, you know works with that person to see if they can't you know deescalate that. If need be, at least we're on standby uh, to help you if you need us. Thanks for that, Joe. And I just want to say that when you all show up for a mental health situation, you are all wonderful on the mental health side of things. I mean, it's it's just amazing the way I see you interact with people who are escalating and just kind of are able to bring them down. And sometimes, yeah, we do need your presence to be able to I, I, my magic powers only go so far. I need, to, I need someone with a badge and, you know, to come in and say, guys, you got to knock it down, you know, and then you know, we're able to do that. So thanks for that. I just, uh, you know, in an effort to help you out, I, you know, if we got more, you know, get more money over resources over to mobile crisis, that could be a help for you, you all, I think. So just a, just a thought for all of us to think about. So, but thank you for all your work. You know, you've been a godsend to us over the years. So thank you. I'll be back soon. Any more questions for Dan or Joe? Not seeing any. All right, well, thanks very much. Very interesting and helpful. And uh, we're very grateful for what you've been doing on Hudson Avenue for all you do. And uh, we get the staffing issue. Uh, I don't think we have anyone here from zoning and code enforcement tonight. I don't see Rick, Virginia? You need to unmute.
Virginia, you're muted. We can't hear you. Virginia? Okay, here I am. I'm sorry. I think I finally <laughs> Um, all right, so I'm on the coding committee, and um, as Leah sent out a message that I can just read if you want, which is a summary of what, what was going on. You want me to read that? Thank you. Okay. Thank you good. Okay, so it says here, Virginia, Carolyn, and I met with the WUSU to discuss the conditional use permit application and his business plans, and this has to do with um, the pub that is currently owned and will be continue to be owned by BM and T. Um, okay. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Okay. I will send meeting notes by Friday night along with any thoughts on the workshop. We're supposed to be watching the workshop that took place, um, I believe, Wednesday night. Um, None of us were available to watch it, but it's been recorded, so we will be doing that. Um, uh, please review the workshop by the end of the weekend. We will discuss the email after the workshop about whether the committee wants to have another meeting with the WUSU. After that, we will discuss whether we want to take a position on the application. And based on that decision, if we decide to take a position on the application, we will forward the position to the full board for a vote. The planning board will meet on September 28th to discuss this case. So I can say, and Carolyn can um, add to this if she wants, that um, we had a pretty good discussion with the WUSU. Um, he plans to have a different business model from the pub. Um, one of the main things is he's closing at two rather than four. Um, he is going to serve more food. Um, apparently the pub only served minimum, which was basically a bag of pretzels or some bag snacks. He will have um, wings and macaroni and cheese and some other kind of bar food such as that. Um, he will have someone at the door to scan um, ID cards. So, um, to prevent underage drinking. Um, and he'll be dropping in every so often. Um, he will not be managing it himself, but he plans on having a full-time manager uh, be open from four in the afternoon to two in the morning. And he would like to draw an eclectic clientele. So I don't know if Carolyn has anything else to add to that, but we all will be watching the recorded uh, workshop. And as Leah says in her message, we'll be, um, you know, if necessary, we'll bring it to the full board if some kind of action is recommended by the committee. Yeah, I don't have much more to add to that. It's the location of the former Partridge Pub, um, right, um, right near, uh, I think that's right next to uh, Ruby's Asian. Um, and yeah, so it sound, looks like it will be a slightly different model to what was there. And, and then like Virginia said, it'll open earlier. So this is a business that he will own, but not that, but not a business that he will be running someone he'll be hiring a manager. So, and I'm sure he can give us all the details once he gets passed through all the regulatory process. So. Okay. Well, Carolyn, you can just keep on going. We're to the Midtown Fine Hills Committee. While I'm up. Um, our first meeting of the program year will be Monday, uh, September 27th at 6.30 p.m. on Zoom. If anyone is interested in participating who hasn't participated in the past, let me know and I can get a... Um, a link out to you and I'll be sending out um, reminders uh, about the meeting uh, short soon. Um, we are still working on two of the primary projects that we've worked on is the, the trash and litter and trees and streets. And I know that um, the off-campus ambassadors have been delivering the um, handouts with uh, information about managing trash and recycling and litter that uh, we developed last spring. Um, so that's, 
that's starting and getting underway. I'm not sure, and I was going to ask you tonight if they have started the, um, I forget what, what they called it, but the program where students get credit for um, doing cleanup. But um, uh, I think they are planning to start it and expand it this semester. Um, in terms of this trees and streets program, uh, we'll probably have a meeting sometime soon just to see where we are. I just wanted to clarify one thing that John said earlier. I spoke with Sam Wells today about these new Love Your Block grants, and they're really not that particular grant funding might be useful a little bit, but there's a different program he thinks that will work better for us because the funder um, of those block grants wants the bulk of those funds to go to um, low income communities of color, specifically West Hill, Arbor Hill and the South End. Um, but there are other potential funding options for um, addressing some of the, um, so at least starting a pilot process for uh, some of the blocks um, for, uh, for reducing, increasing trees, reducing blacktop and um, increasing green space in, in the uh, neighborhood. And I think that is it. Um, uh, Barara will update about the mural that we had planned on work or that we were working on. Um, and I think that's all I have for Midtown Pine Hills. I know we're not having any events this fall. Um, Meet Munch and More did not happen. And um, I think the university is not all that interested in funding dinners right now with Delta going, um, going around. So hopefully by next spring, we'll be able to start having events again, so. And I think that's all I have. Uh, if anybody else has any questions, I'm here to answer, if I can. Thanks, Carolyn. Not seeing or hearing any questions. Uh, let's go to Treasurer's Report, Eric. Hey, Ms. good evening, Marilyn. folks. Okay. Sure. Yeah, sorry, I thought I heard somebody talking there. Um, so just a quick, we did get a bunch of renewals. I sent those to you guys and to Will over the last week or so. And we got a, um, we got a business app, uh, membership from the, um, Jank, is it Janko that owns Rise? Is that the name yeah. of the company? Okay, from those guys. So yeah, they joined, which is great. Um, and is the, is the post office actually there at this point? Or is it's it... under construction. I spent a little time visiting with them and saw it. It's uh, okay for a temporary post office. It looks pretty nice. It's not open yet. It, 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 a little bit. I would almost say that. I don't want to go there though. But uh, we're still hoping that you know the, the new Scotland will open. But uh, it looks looks pretty nice. In fact, I got a tour of the whole facility. They are 100% rented. They have a lot of uh, doctors, not at all many med uh, personnel staying there. And uh, well, I saw a lot of happy people in a really nice place to live. Uh, oh, don't get me wrong, great. I'm not, not putting the house on the market, but you know, it's, uh, it's a nice place and a real nice addition to the neighborhood. I was impressed. Yeah. No, so we thank great. them for their membership too. I, yeah, yeah. Um, it's a, just yeah so a quick report um the paypal at this point is we have a couple of ways to join or, or to to pay for your membership one of the ways is through paypal so we get currently there's 273 dollars and 80 cents the trustco account has five thousand six hundred fifty six dollars and 77 cents in it uh 837 of that is for the madison park grant which we've yet to um to need to spend. So we have uh, $4,819 or $4,819 and 77 cents uh, currently. That's where we are. Um, so any questions or anything? I did send a bunch of the, um, um, the membership uh, through this. I think some of them are Stripe and PayPal. So I did forward those to Will. So hopefully he's got those last night, so. Okay, um, I don't know, how do I do this? I don't know, which, who, which hammer wants to go first here? Or Virginia, I guess, and then we'll 
John, you're on unmuted. Me. John, you can go first. You're unmuted. There you go. Okay, I will go first. Uh, we used to have an annual, uh, take some money annually and, and give it to charitable institutions if we had the money to spare. It seems to me we have almost $5,000 in the bank. We don't have to pay for a newsletter anymore. That was used to be a big expense, printing and postage. So has any thought been given to uh, donating some money to somebody worthwhile? Not like me, but other people? Yeah, it's no, certainly I, not. I think God. Certainly an option. So yeah, definitely. Uh, this is um, something the board should take up. I agree. We do have a, a current surplus. Uh, and as we've discussed, it'd be nice to have sort of a, just a basic budget as we go forward. It's been a really weird year, two years in terms of lowered expenditures and, and we're still collecting dues. But uh, we do want to look, uh, I've found basically for uh, packages like Zoom and Constant Contact, and even the Doodle Poll, which we use a lot of scheduled meetings, you get so much more if you pay for them. They'll give you a free version, but it barely works. And John, you mentioned the newsletter. It might be worth it for us to consider purchasing a patch that helps better. I don't have or pretend to have an answer to this, but I think we'll have some of that. But I, we are definitely in a, in a position to uh, to make donations where we think it's appropriate within the neighborhood, and we should consider that. So I ask board members to sort of develop their ideas, and we'll share them around and talk about that as uh, we have our October meeting, if that makes sense. I'd also like to say that while we're on that topic, um, I want to make sure that we um, make use or make note of some of our expenses such as the um, free movies and possibly you know the Elks concerts although we're having a meeting with them in the spring to go over you know ha having them kind of take over um, that but just things have come along um, and one thing I wanted to ask Eric was whether he has paid for the movie because um, we keep hearing from Jonathan Heinrich about the free movie that we showed at St. Rose and whether uh, Eric has sent the check to Albany Public Library um, for the amount that we promised to pay. I I have I have not. Was there a if they want to send me something or give me the contact after the meeting, I'll I'll send them an email. They can send me that and send it over. If, if was something was sent, I I didn't get it. So okay, yeah, something was sent um, about our share, but I I can ask them again or I can look through my email and okay. um, and oh, do that. Yeah. Yep, it's easy enough. I I haven't. Um, haven't sent something, but we did, and we did spend, I think it was $100 for the Elks concerts. So there was a couple of, I think it was. Yeah, Marilyn, yeah. well, you gave me $100 that I gave to them, and I think Marilyn gave you $100, um, and then we had two sponsors. So the okay. Neighborhood Association itself paid $100. Okay. But we only had four concerts, and next year we're hoping to have six, so we'll have to talk more about that in the spring and see. How that might work out yeah hopefully things will be um better okay thank you yep. and it looks like perry's next so you may already do this but uh, just you know putting my fundraising hat on um you know when you have these opportunities like the movies and things you know maybe when you send out that awesome news you know uh thing to say that you know we have this opportunity if somebody would like to be an angel and sponsor this, uh, you know, you might be able to get some people, you know, we, we absolutely, in my experience, have some very generous people that live in our uh, Pine Hills neighborhood. So, you know, there might be some, you know, sometimes people are looking for opportunities to be able to give. So yeah. um, just, a, just the thought, if we don't do that, it might be a great idea to say, you know, hey, we've got this, you know, and we need a sponsor for it. So just wanted to throw that out there. Okay. That's Okay. Thanks, Eric. Yeah. You're welcome. So, John, what I, John, what I said before was it looks like you skipped up or Madison. 
I don't know if they have anything to report, but just pointing that out. You're right. We did. Let's go back up to Upper Madison. I keep looking to see if uh, Luke's popping into the meeting, but I don't think that's going to happen. Marilyn, sorry. Didn't mean to skip oh. you. Well, I'm sorry. I guess I'll just have to sub for, for Luke. But anyway, uh, <laughs> all right. We, we've mentioned the street fair. Um, books can be dropped off at 52 Reitman Ave, or you can email and let me know that you want to contribute books. Uh, we are encouraging mask wearing at the fair. Um, and also we are in conversation with the, pine, uh, the price chopper about improving pedestrian safety uh, going through the parking area. Um, and Virginia, do you want to say anything about rummage stuff? <laughs> You want stuff? <laughs> um, uh, the answer is, wait a minute, am, am I on, am I yeah. on or not? Yeah, you're on. Okay. The answer is, I have so much rummage, but if you really feel the need to contribute more rummage, um, this, is, this is it, because we only have a week between now and the more or less when things are going to be picked up, and we don't have that many people to um, price things, and we hardly have any room left in our house for this stuff. However, if you do have things and they're not huge, um, and you know, it's fine if you want to call me. Um, I need to know who you are so I can anticipate how much you know you might have and see what we can do in the time that we have to price all of it. And, and also uh, talking about the fair, obviously on the Sunday, um, starting at probably 9.30 or so, uh, right up through five o'clock and even after five to clear up, we do need volunteers. So if anyone is interested in helping out, uh, they can contact Ann Savage. Um, I don't know why we don't have a chat thing on our on our little whatever it is down at the bottom, so that we could. I'm I am I'm mystified by that as well. Just oh, all right, because I was going to put the emails so we'd have them. But anyway, anyway, Ann Savage, um, whose whose email I can't remember, unfortunately. But, you know, it would work well for that, Marilyn, if you'd send out, or Virginia, if you could just send out a, an appeal for volunteers and the emails and that through our Google group. Because okay. one of the chat is great, although if the person doesn't get to it and copy it and put it elsewhere, it just goes away. So it doesn't. Okay. okay. All right. I'll, 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 I'll send something out with, uh, with all three uh, pieces of information for the upcoming, uh, upcoming fair. All right, thank you. Okay, now to membership. Will? All right, um, looks like currently we have 76 um, paying neighborhood association members. Um, I just sent out a notice uh, for renewal a little over a week ago. Uh, probably we'll put out a new one um, very soon. Um, and then by the time we give people enough time, it'll be time to ask for 2022. Um, but I guess that's how it's going to go. Um, and so that's where we are right now. It seems we did get a nice uh, spate of renewals. Uh, and I did notice there were some totally new members too. So that's great to see. Uh, wonderful to see it. I don't know if, if we did something in particular in outreach that produced it. If anyone wants to take credit, please step forward. But uh, we love to see it. And I think we've talked about it a couple of times that Marilyn had been uh, collecting uh, 
from the, the newspaper's listing of deeds, you know, names of new homeowners and putting in their addresses, that would be, I mean, uh, that might be worth doing some outreach, send them something in the mail and see if we can get them hooked up. We, we, uh, we do need more hands on deck to produce these materials, but it would be nice to have a welcome neighbor. Would you like to join? It doesn't have to be a lot of paper, but uh, uh, some of the things that work best are short and simple, you know, a short note from a member of the board saying, you in town, would you like to join? We do these things. Here's our website, think about it. Because uh, I really think we do wanna try and grow the membership if we can. It's been difficult without having in-person meetings, but still somehow we are getting some new people in the door and that's wonderful. Can I ask a quick question, Ms. Lori? Yeah. You said the membership stuff went out about a week ago? Uh, September 8th. Okay, because the Elks Lodge still has not received a letter of renewal and I get the mail. Uh, so it wouldn't be in the mail, it'd be an email. I'll send out an email reminder. Okay, even email, I'm not sure where it's going. Uh, Albany Elks at NICAP is the email and I'm not sure what email you've got on file for them. Oh, uh, okay. Um, I see what's happened. I will have to, I can send an email after this. Um, that's fine. Uh, we, okay. And uh, Laura, you could mention it too, right? If you're there, just say, hey, you know, we're, we're changing over some of our membership systems so it's possible some folks didn't see it or didn't get it the way they were used to. So Actually, no, like it, it's it's me. I'm the secretary at the lodge. I haven't seen it at all <laughs> since well, April. I've been there. All right, but but if you get it and you send it, renew. how's that? <laughs> yes, I mean if you get it and you send it, I can I can put it in and they'll renew. <laughs> you can only do it if you receive a notice. Exactly. From yes. Okay. Yep. yep. All right. Unfortunately, the, the same for a lot of businesses and not for profits. We need the, 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 the sort of the invoice, if you would, and then we can pop it right out. So I don't know if anyone has the time or if we have any of that extra money to be able to, you know, pay for that. But uh, just a, just a thought. I know sometimes I, I go with the Damien Center and go, did we pay? Did we not pay? You know, so. Yeah, so businesses are a separate list that um, we should probably get a new. Uh, a reminder out soon. Okay. And some of them may need something looking like an invoice, though in truth it's an ask for a donation. Uh, that is the case with at least one that I'm familiar with. So maybe, uh, and when we do this, we should probably keep notes. Some of the problem we hadn't taken it over, we weren't sure, for example, what some institutions had committed to. So it's, uh, it's always good to have notes in a file somewhere. But we're making progress, people, you know, getting noticed, going up. We might, as we move into 2022, since we're a little late this year, maybe we'll, we'll wait until March to begin. <laughs> that way, at least there will be a, a break in between notes for membership. But uh, most of all, it's good to see new people coming in. You know, I want to say to all members of the board and everyone on this, uh, a lot of recruiting all of it, in fact, whether it's uh, new members for the association, returning members, or whether it's people who might want to help out with a board, it really needs the personal touch. We can send out an email, we can talk about it, but we really, we all have to think about people who might uh, become involved and, you know, talk to them wherever you see them or, or put it in whatever other communication you're sending to them. It's really, us, we, the people on this call, are are in the best position to stimulate new members. So let's make sure everybody's trying to do that. I mean, don't push people, but you know, let them know. Hey, we'd love to have you, and uh, maybe we'll get a few more members. Uh, Can I just ask Will again? I'm sorry, but just for the notes, how many members do we have now? Uh, Seventy-six different payments uh, that doesn't include like size household size or anything or, like, okay 76 okay um 
Okay, the second thing I would like to suggest, because um, I think it helps to have something when you're talking to people to have something in your hand that you might want to give them is some kind of, we used to do this green membership, this green form. Uh, maybe we don't want to do that again, or maybe we just want to make it a little bit shorter, but I think it's nice to have something to just give out to people that they can take with them, you know, um, with just reasons for joining or what the Neighborhood Association can do for you. I, we put these in the library, Pine Hills Neighborhood Library. Um, there are other things we can do, like when we have the free movie, we can we usually have somebody there to hand these things out or to talk to people about joining. And also at the Elks concerts, um, I've been talking to people there. I like to go to them because you see people from the neighborhood and you can talk to them and say, how about joining? But I never, I don't have anything to give them because we aren't doing, you know, I don't have any more copies. I guess there are some down in Perry's office, but you know, if we just had like a rack card or just something that we can put places or even give to people with the information on it about how to join. That would be my suggestion. I agree. Uh, I, I'd recommend the rack card or, you know, smaller in size, but having something would be nice. I think we're, I don't know if we're totally out of stock. I know that I don't have any more of those, but why don't we just start anew and do something we can do, but we uh, hopefully we'll get uh, some more people in as well to help out with that, but good suggestion. I have a question. Uh, uh, has SUNY Albany renewed? Yes. They have, okay, because they were used to be very fussy. You know, I used to send Luke a reminder and he says, no, I need an invoice, I need an invoice. So good, you must have taken care of that. Good, thank I'm, you. I'm not gonna say he was the one who, but you know, the other not-for-profits may also want an invoice like that, but yes, they're, they're renewed. Uh, although honestly, I don't think, you know, we should go ahead and reach out to people, but not uh, via these meetings. Uh, I think we are concluded. Anything Jane, else? Jane has to see him. Elected. Elected. Oh yes, of course. Wait, Jay. Jay Meeks has his hand up. Go ahead, Jay. For uh, oh, oh, to you. Great. Lucky to be unmuted. So, um, great to see everyone again. Um, so I am an actually a member of my um community association back home um in Detroit where I own a house, and um and forgive me if this has been mentioned, but um. One thing that we've done um, to, to sort of highlight that we exist as an association is having lawn signs, little lawn decals um, with the logo of our association that people can put um, in their, in their, uh, in the lawn or the berm, wherever they choose to. Interesting. Well, there's, there's another suggestion we could do. We have a couple of signs we used to use to uh, promote our meetings, but as they're no longer in person or at LaSalle, uh, we'd need to change them. But uh, I think it's another great idea. Thank you, Jay. Well, and and no, you could still use the signs, but you could use a QR code actually. And so um, people can take their phones and it would link to, to uh, the meeting. To our so, website. I, yeah, so I'm, I'm happy to, to help with with anything use me um as, as you see fit so i'm kind of technologically savvy and and so um so i'm here at your disposal jay thank you you will be hearing from us i promise <laughs> shortly uh great great news best news all night uh and i'd love to you know i'd love for us to to modernize a bit and have a qr that zaps you to our website and membership sign up uh, okay, going back to the gallery view. Luke is not here, but he has been doing a great job as have others at the university uh, working with the police and DGS and everyone else on Hudson Avenue. We do appreciate it. Our next meeting will be October 21st. We've not set the speaker yet, but uh, the mayor and the police chief are both possibilities or it may be someone else. We're kind of going as we go. And who knows, maybe we'll get good news in a month or two and know that we'll be able to go, go back to in public meetings, but John, we don't know until we know. 
Yeah. Nicolina wants to talk. Oh. <laughs> Nicolina, forgive me. And you hung in through the whole Hi there. Um, from, uh, I hope you can hear me. Yes. Hi. I hope you all can hear me. My internet's been a little bit in and out. Um, can you just give me like a thumbs up or a wave or something just so I can make sure that everyone can hear me okay? Okay, great. Thank you. I'll keep my um, comments really, really quick. Um, <clears throat> as I know, it's, it's 837 and we're all likely very tired. Um, so I am Assemblywoman Patricia Fahey's Director of Community Affairs. I'm pretty new to the office. I've been with her for about five months or so, um, but I have lived in the Pine Hills neighborhood for the last three years or so. Um, and so I'm very happy to be here for that very reason. Um, I just wanna say for folks that are um, you know, paying attention to state politics, um, Assemblywoman Patricia Fahey is very happy to let folks know that she is um, she has been selected as the, the chair of the banking committee. And so this is a very new assignment for her um, and something that she is honored to take on after her eight years of serving. Um, I do also want to say that I know that there is no chat feature, unfortunately, so I can't provide my email. Um, however, with my position, um, we have been assisting folks in a variety of different constituent services matters, um, including getting folks in touch with the Department of Labor when they experience uh, UI issues, small business supports, um, just interfacing with government agencies, however that might be. And we're also promoting the Emergency Rental Assistance Program for homeowners, tenants, and landlords for folks that are in need that might not be aware of the program, um, as well as the broadband credit and child tax credit, which I'm happy to send along to John if, if he um, would like to send that along to other folks. Um, just getting a sense of the programs that are out there that people might not be aware of. And then um, I, I heard John mention earlier uh, the fact that the Neighborhood Association wrote a letter in support of the um, Academy Post Station, um, which Assemblywoman Fahey was also happy to do. And we have been pushing to try to keep that location at the New Scotland um, in the, the former location. We're trying to maintain the same location as, as there is that temporary location currently. Um, and we want to make sure that it, it does stay in New Scotland as it is such a valuable asset to folks in Pine Hills as well as within the sort of Helderberg neighborhood. I um, also want to mention we are, our office is volunteering at um, a number of different Catholic Charities food distributions. And so if folks know of anybody that is in need of food, um, living, you know, in food insecurity, you know, you're welcome to reach out to our office to ask for more information. We do volunteer pretty regularly and so we would love to see a, a friendly face there. Um, but we also just want to let folks know that this is a um, an option that's available to them, you know, um, no questions asked, of course. Um, and COVID has, has created difficult circumstances for everybody. Um, and then we're also just kind of prepping for a session next year, beginning in January, um, beginning to address gaps in environmental policies, as that's something that's um, very important to the Assemblywoman, as well as gaps in, um, legislation regarding um, gun usage, um, as folks might know, the PLACA bill, um, which holds gun manufacturers accountable past this past session. And so just limiting gun violence in our, our neighborhoods, our communities is something that um, is really close to her heart and that she will continue to work on. And so, um, yeah, I'll, I'll be sure to send on um, my contact information if anybody has any questions or would like to hear um, more about any of the programs that are available on the state level. We're always happy to help. And um, yeah, looking forward to attending these in the future um, as a Pine Hill um, neighbor. So yeah, thank you, everybody. Fantastic. Thank you, McElena. While you were speaking, I sent your email information to the board and I copied you on that. So you can now share information directly with the board. We'll take out the middleman who may fail to assiduously pass it on in seconds. You know, so it's always it's always better to go direct. And uh, we appreciate your uh, being here and sharing information with us. And of course, uh, Pat Fahey is always welcome to join us as well when she can. Uh, we had a we had a great meeting with her. I think it was a couple of years ago. Any questions for Michalina? No. No, just a reminder that we do have one elected official on. Yeah, Baroro, I'm not able to uh, send them a chat. Are you 
prepared to. Uh... Oh, I just don't have a. I don't have a question, but I want a suggestion um, regarding uh, the assemblywoman, the work that she's doing to address 787 to make it into a boulevard. I just want to thank her for her advocacy and all that she do uh, for our city and our assembly district. So I uh, just definitely want to thank her for um, highlighting the need to bridge the divide, particularly and having access to our waterfront back again. Thanks, Uusu. I didn't even know you were here. You are. Uh, do you have other stuff you want to share? All right. Well, yeah, um, if I know everybody received, I sent my newsletter a couple of days ago, um, so I'm not going to go into all of that. Um, it's that time of the year again in the city of Albany where budget season. Um, I'm going to continue to advocate for resources for our neighborhood as it relates to sidewalks and road improvements. Um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we met, I met with the mayor uh, to bring your priorities, particularly as it relates to having some new technology with the cameras in the neighborhood. Uh, that's been advocating also there's going to be uh, some improvements that the mayor is going to be, she doesn't want me to make this announcement yet, but I think she's going to make the announcement at uh, the Midtown Pinehills block party that's taking place as it relates to improvements on um, Midtown Pinehills from the 800 block of Madison Avenue. Um, you know, so if you have any suggestions or uh, priorities, I know the consistent one is the tarp on the streets. Uh, try to get those removed and try to set up a meeting. That is very important. And the mayor and BGS are well aware. Uh, but if you have any other suggestions as relates to budget that you think should be a priority for our neighborhood, I'm more than happy and I'm always accessible, whether a phone call or uh, email. Um, there are some businesses that are coming into our neighborhood, Bart and Baker. Um, I'm not sure if somebody spoke about it, but we're really excited. Every, I haven't been inside, but I keep peeking inside and it's always uh, crowded. Um, and I'm excited that we are having a, a vacant location that has been vacant for quite a few months since the coffee shop left, uh, just opened up again. So we're really excited about that. There's a new coffee shop that's actually um, opening at 811 Madison next to the flower shop. And I just recently got details about it literally two days ago. Um, so they, they're trying to uh, do a soft opening this Saturday in conjunction with uh, the block party that's taking place um, is going to be called the Iron, I believe. Uh, so it's going to be a coffee shop right next to uh, 811 uh, Madison, a flower shop. Um, as many of you are aware, there's some improvements. National Grid is making improvements uh, in our neighborhood, particularly on Myrtle, some on Partridge. And i um, sorry for the inconvenience, but I, uh, they are under uh, a decree to fix some of these um, uh, lines that have been damaged for years. Um, so um, outside of that, everything is going well uh, in the neighborhood and I'm excited to dig deep into the budget this year. Um, and then last thing, the legislation that I'm working on with building on codes, uh, currently we want to make sure that uh, whatever status that's taking place with an abandoned or vacant property, individuals could go towards that property, put a QRS code, and be able to Google the information and the status of that property. Um, this is something that has been done in Baltimore um, and it's been very effective. Uh, very too often, there are properties that we don't have contact information for, uh, whether it's uh, an abandoned or we have an absentee landlord. So I'm working with Building on Codes and our corporation council where um, next to the red X, or even if it's vacant, we're able to put a information, maybe uh, some type of uh, information where individuals can figure out what the status is. Currently, to get information on an abandoned or vacant property, you will have to go into the city's website, map geo, and then other steps that you have to take. But some people are not familiar with those type of steps. So I believe that that information needs to be accessible to police, it needs to be accessible to the fire department, it needs to be accessible to neighbors um, if they want to purchase that property or whether to make a complaint regarding that property. Um, so that's a piece of legislation that I'm working on and we'll be having more details um, in a few, in a couple of weeks. Ooh, so I wasn't quite sure what you said. The mayor is going to be at the uh, middle Madison block party on Saturday. Did you say she had an announcement of something? 
Um, yeah, David Gallant texted me two days ago saying that there's going to be an announcement as it relates to, um, and I'm supposed to, <laughs> you know, I'm usually supposed to keep this on a, on a wrap, but, you know, you guys are family, so whatever I hear, I'm sharing with you guys. Uh, but, yeah, I think the mayor is going to be making an announcement uh, as it relates to some improvements to uh, Midtown Pineals. Well, the question was what? <laughs> You're not sure. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, okay. So, <laughs> All right. Well, we'll see. Do you know? Do you know what time? I'll I'll send David a note. Don't worry. But all right. Uh, sounds good. I just I'm, like this, you know from when um and I probably wasn't supposed to say anything, but I think that David just essentially texted me off the record to kind of say that the mayor will be making potentially might be making some type of announcement as relates to like streetscape or something like that. So that's all I can share at this moment. But yeah, you're you more know than happy. Okay. Do you know what time she'll be there so we can be there when she does that? Um, I believe. Did he say? Yeah, five o'clock. Okay, thank you. Yeah, five o'clock. Yeah, I, I, Carolyn, if you could please be there and others, but I'll reach out to David too. We kind of, but uh, well, this will be on the you know YouTube tomorrow, so <laughs> I don't think you, I don't think you went too far. All right, thanks. Okay, Maria. that's good. That's good. I think the mayor just wanted to make that announcement. So I hope I didn't step on toes or anything like that. Sometimes she likes to surprise neighbor neighbors. Sure, but then uh, we should at least have people from Midtown there, right? So. Correct, correct, correct. All right, thanks. Uh, Barroro, our county legislator. Thank you very much, John. Uh, since everybody else has taken a lot of time tonight, I'm just going to go right to it. Uh, the first thing I want to touch on is the mural. Uh, we had a conversation with, uh, I had a conversation this afternoon with Caroline and uh, Owusu. And uh, it seems to me that uh, the concept of what I intended for the mural on the House of Glass is not what the Neighborhood Association wanted or some members of the Neighborhood Association wanted. So, but this was uh, the concept that I had, which is to uh, basically honor or pay some kind of a tribute to the pandemic heroes, which is the nurses and the doctors that have been fighting on the forefront of the pandemic. Uh, is the agreement that I had with the chairman of the legislature, Andrew Joyce. Uh, both of us are funding this mural, uh, basically to honor the pandemic heroes. And uh, I'm not sure if it is coming from the Pine Hills Neighborhood Association, the leadership, or from anyone else, but it seemed to me that the artist that we, that the Neighborhood Association shows to go with, uh, is not willing to amend the design that she presented uh, to fall in line with what we agreed on or what I uh, requested. So I think what is going to go on from here is that I am going to take on the project myself and possibly reach out uh, with a, a request for proposal and also speak with the artist that you have initially uh, 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 given this to and basically go from there. Uh, so yeah, that is on the mural. So we are still working on the funding. The funding is going to be uh, very close to getting that funding uh, as soon as possible. Uh, the next thing is that I spoke with uh, the developers for the Loft project. The Loft Project is the project between uh, Western Avenue and Washington Avenue on Quail. And it's basically going to be replacing about nine, or uh, it's going to be replacing nine uh, buildings right there on Quail. And it's going to, uh, uh, according to the new plan that they discussed with me, is going to house 80, that is 80 uh, units 80, 80 apartments and three commercial spots. And uh, out of those 80 units that are going to be, uh, that is going to be in that uh, complex, 
five of those, they said it's going to be affordable units and uh, plus three commercial spots. Um, the one of the issues or perhaps the biggest issue that I heard a lot of neighbors uh, complain about when we when I first discussed this project with a lot of people uh, about sometime last year was that parking is going to be an issue. And a lot of people had an uh, issue uh, where complaining that uh, this new building is going to take their parking and people are not going to have places where they can park their cars or drive in peace. And uh, I brought this up to the developers and the funders and they assured me that they are going to be providing parking for 85 uh, parking spots they suggested. Yep, they said they're going to provide 85 parking spots as part of the unit. So I'm guessing it's going to be like in the bottom floor and the units are going to be on top. And But they are going to be showing me the plan within the next two weeks. And so I should be able to see that. But they said they're going to be providing 85 parking uh, lots. for So that would mean each unit is going to have at least one parking uh, lot. And that is all I have, uh, legislation that I'm currently working on. I said I wasn't going to go too long. <laughs> legislation that I'm currently working on is um, a post-FMLA Family Cares Act, and which is basically going to uh, ensure that employees and new, new parents uh, get an additional three months of working from home post bed. So which means uh, nursing mothers who are usually uh, breastfeeding for six months uh, can get the three months, initial three months, which is provided by the state. They usually get three months of FMLA, uh, that is paid family leave. Uh, and what my legislation is, is offering is an additional three months for parents to work from home and uh, for positions that can actually be done remotely. So if there is any position that cannot be done remotely, then the employer has to say that in writing and reasons why those positions cannot be done remotely. That is all I have for now. We provided a lot of grants for small businesses during the pandemic. We are still in the pandemic, uh, but yeah, we did provide a lot of grants during the pandemic. It was originally my idea to do it. And I'm glad that we were able to provide those grants to small businesses who were struggling a lot during the pandemic. That is all I have for now. Looks um, like Carolyn has her hand up. Yes, yeah, I just wanted to clarify, we did, uh, the Neighborhood Association did not take a stance on the theme for the mural. It was the artist did not want to change her design. And that was the only artist we have been working with. And we, you and I agreed that then, that then if she's not willing to change the design, then she's not the right artist for this particular project. I will say that in conversation with other members of the board, the one thing that has come up that we would be concerned about would be, um, would be, um, we would really, really, really rather not have images of people with masks on in the neighborhood. And honestly, I think you might have trouble finding a building owner that would go for that anyway. Um, but in terms of pandemic heroes for, for um, our, we, we had a misunderstanding about what the theme actually was, but we don't have a position on what you're choosing to do. If, if that's what you wanna do, we don't have a problem with that. We agree that the artist did not fulfill what it was that we asked her to do, what, what it was specifically that you asked her to do. So um, yeah, we're not, we're not, we're not, we don't have a position on the theme. It's not, that was never a concern of ours. So that's all Thank I have. Thank you for oh. clarifying that. Okay, thanks. And thanks for letting us know about the lofts. I've been wondering about that forever. <laughs> You're welcome. And uh, hopefully one, one of these days uh, after I see the plan, I should be able to uh, get them to uh, show you the, uh, show, bring uh, present that plan to the association directly. Okay. Uh, 
now I think we're concluded. We've, we've covered all the elected officials who are here, and I think we've, we've been through. So uh, we'll see you next month. And uh, as everyone knows, this video will be on our YouTube by tomorrow and on available through our website. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. Good night.